I'm a senior lecturer at the, at the University of Canberra here at the, the Department of Civil and Natural Resources Engineering. But before starting in 2009, uh, during my PhD, I spent four months here in, uh, in Canberra, and uh, then I went back to Milan because my, my, my this, let's say, my city where I spend most of my time is here in Milan, even more my origin are from Sicily. And, uh, and then uh, I came back again for a postdoc. Then I went back to uh, Milan as assistant professor over there. And then after four years in 2009, I came back again. So, and I'm not going back to Italy again. So, <laughs> so that's, I hope so. so. Um, and uh, I always say that uh, the reasons why I decided to go to New Zealand is because if I look at Italy and New Zealand, the position with respect to the equator is pretty much the same. Say, so, okay, maybe the weather is pretty much the same, but it's not true, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, if you look at the shape, you see this is Italy, this is New Zealand, and then if you rotate Italy or 180 degrees, I say, oh, but pretty much the shape is the same. <laughs> And I was expecting, being in the south, that the, the, again the weather was very similar to the to the north part of Italy. But really, the main reason why I decided to come over here because the University of Canterbury, especially the Department of uh, Civil Engineering, is a, a world-leading department for uh, for earthquake engineering, and uh, we have earthquakes in Italy as well. And uh, obviously, uh, I know that uh, New Zealand and uh, the Department uh, of Civil Structure Engineering was really one of the top. Uh, world leading department, so that's why I came over here. And of course, because I like also the country, and the, uh, that always was a plus to, for my decision. So, this is pretty much my introduction. So, now we can start about the talk. So, the talk is going to be it's quite a long talk, so I will try then maybe to cut off something. And, uh, but the idea is try to give you a little bit of a picture of what, uh, what is a little bit the history of, of uh, Christchurch bridges, but uh, I will really not try to go too much into the details of that part. The view of, uh, of the key things related to history that then will help you to understand the performance of bridges during the earthquakes, during Canberra earthquakes. And then in the, in the final part, we will discuss about uh, what can we do? What sort of uh, innovation can we can bring into the design of uh, and replacement of those uh, of those bridges that we have here in the city. So, I would say, what I want to do start with is something strange. So, uh, let's try to connect uh, bridges with philosophy, which is really uh, uh, something that looks very odd. And uh, I'm, I would like to mention uh, Martin Heidegger, who is a German philosopher, and. Uh, and uh, what is, is amazing in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in what, uh, what uh, he, he said is that uh, in, uh, in one of, of, uh, of his books, this is the Building Dwelling Thinking, he was basically talking about bridges. And uh, what he really pointed out is that uh, a bridge is not just a functional object, but a bridge has uh, two meanings, as, uh, is a sort of referential object and is also has a symbolic, symbolic meaning. And uh, I mean, he also says that uh, a bridge uh, reflects uh, the fourfold, uh, which are at the base of the uh, of the old dwelling, and the, these uh, fourfold are earth, sky, mort mortals, and divinities. So, obviously, this is a quite strong uh, vision of uh, Heidegger, but uh, I think that. Uh, uh, in a sense, uh, without being a philosophy, we can say that uh, a bridge is not just a structure. And uh, I think more than a building, a bridge uh, is really something that, uh, as a first instant, when you go into a country, is one of the first things that you notice if you have a very nice bridge, even if you, have, if you see a very ugly bridge. So it's uh, really something that uh, it goes beyond the, the object. And that, uh, if with that, I really, really with uh, Heidegger. Now, in fact, uh, just to give you a little bit of a uh, feeling of what I felt when I was uh, preparing the presentation last night. So this is uh, Ilcrest Bridge, is a New Zealand bridge, is uh, north of Auckland. And uh, when I see this bridge, I see freedom and lightness. So because you see, it's very slender. And when you go through, you have these uh, nice uh, uh, red pylons, 
that keep you awake when you're driving. And then you have this uh, strange shape, which is not straight, but it looks like it's accommodated with the, with the valley. And then we have the, I always tell my students when I teach uh, uh, the second year of civil engineering, this, then we have uh, the Otira Valley, and I, say, I tell them this is the pride of South Island. This is the, I think it's actually, from my point of view, is even the best bridge that we have here in New Zealand. And when I see the Otira Viaduct, I see challenge and determination because it's really going through a very, very steep valley. You see the shape, it's winding shape, and then uh, we have uh, less than 2K, we have uh, the Alpine Fault. So that is really, I see that this for me is challenge and determination. And then we have uh, the uh, Bridge of Remembrance. And so when I look at that bridge, you see it's quite, it's quite a old bridge, of course, it's 1924. It's quite mm, big and uh, imponent. And so I see protection from that bridge and I see also elegance. So obviously, I just wanted to put the Denix examples. I could even put uh, you know, ugly bridges. And obviously, when you see that, obviously, you have the opposite, uh, opposite feeling. But this is really what, uh, what uh, really we have. Uh, we have a sort of communication with bridges, even though it looks very, very strange. Now, when, uh, when I, I put together the, 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 the summary, I was thinking, oh, maybe be before going, instead of going straight to the, to the performance of the earthquakes, let's try also to connect a little bit uh, uh, the history with the performance of the, with, of the Howard uh, Chrysler's bridges. And, uh, and, uh, and after that, uh, what I wanted to do is say, OK, let's now see what uh, innovation can, can we bring, we can bring into, into the, the crisis rebuild, if it's possible. And, uh, and uh, the final part is really my, my view, where I think really that uh, we should spend a lot of money on bridges. It's not because I'm teaching uh, bridges at the University of Canterbury, but it's because uh, we will have a lot of revenue in the, in the long term. Uh, the, I mean, we know quite well our city, and, uh, and uh, it's called the Garden City. You can understand why, because there are many, many green spots. And uh, this is pretty much the, the, uh, the, sort, the building stock that we have. And, uh, and uh, we have uh, the Heaven River going through the city, which has a very winding path. And, uh, and this is the, the city before the earthquake. And now this is the city, the earlier view uh, after the earthquake. So obviously, with a lot of demolition of, of the building. So what's, what uh, uh, that picture is telling me that, uh, obviously, there is, uh, we have to redesign a city. And that means that uh, we have an opportunity there of uh, building a, an integrated design with bridges, roads, and uh, buildings. The, the, we have really a great opportunity, and, uh, but the point is which way we want to go, because uh, the time is very limited. Uh, I mean, you, you might be aware there is a um, skirt, is a stronger crash infrastructure uh, rebuild team, uh, is, a, is a sort of a consortium is going to be the life of that consortium is five years. So that means that everything has to be done in five years, or almost in five years. So an innovation sometimes takes time. So civil engineering is not an easy, an easy discipline. It's not like uh, IT stuff where you do invent something, and the following day you have the app on the iPhone. This is different, because there is safety here. And so it takes a lot of time to convince people, the engineers, to go to get into something new. So we. We have really an opportunity, but obviously is, uh, we have uh, the, a sort of barrier. We have to try to get into the, uh, the mind of the practitioners and make sure that they can risk a little bit more uh, than what maybe they are thinking to do. The other, thing is, the other point is that even though we have accepted that, uh, uh, we, got a lot of, we got a lot of traffic disruption. So we got many bridges that have been uh, disrupted. I mean, in terms of life safety, we were fine, we didn't have any problem. But uh, if we think that we are progressing, uh, 20 years ago we were researching uh, uh, 
uh, with researching uh, structures in order to make sure that, that they, they don't collapse. And obviously, we still have, uh, we got, unfortunately, some, some, um, some uh, uh, building failures. But uh, now, especially here at the University of Canterbury, we are going beyond that. We want to have a structure which is able to sustain the earthquakes is also what we want. We want to have a structure which doesn't damage after the earthquake, where we basically can locate some fuses that we go there, we fix these fuses, and then the structure is ready to go. So that means that we want to have a structure which remains uh, functional after the earthquake. That is really what we, we should achieve. So even though we can say, OK, as the bridge has been closed just for five days, I can go on the other way and then go to, to, to the war. That's fine. But I know that is not the end of the world. But why should we accept that? So we should always try to improve if we can. And now before going into the earthquakes, I would like to just uh, briefly touch base the history. And uh, I mean, if you are. Probably you know, I mean, you certainly you know more than I do. But certainly what I recommend uh, is really to uh, look at this uh, a book written by, by John Hines, A City of Bridges. And, uh, and I found that, that book very, very useful even for me to build up a little bit of knowledge. So what I, uh, as I said, what I want to do is just to touch a few things that uh, will help you to understand better the performance of uh, Christchurch bridges. It's not really a, deep, uh, a deeper study into the history of bridges. So first thing is that uh, we, we call the city uh, the garden city. That's not what's happening. It's the garden city. And uh, so it's OK. So I thought it was I touched something, but <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, that's. <laughs> All right. So, the the we we call the crash the, of the the garden city, but uh, there are other definitions. There is the city that shines, but there is uh, there is also a book which says the city built upon a swamp. It is really the truth because if you look at the at uh, this map, this was uh, more than 100 years ago. Uh, the Christchurch, I mean, the early settlement were in this area. Uh, and I think with the Dean's family. And uh, this is really the, the size of the city. And uh, if you look at this legend, uh, you basically have, you see, Rapo Swamp. And this pretty much is Swamp. Bottle Lake is all Swamp. And then you go here, all around Avon, this is Swamp. And this is a Swamp, this is sand. And even in the area where I live, in this area, there are some uh, parts which are, you know, are a swamp and other parts which are okay. So, and uh, just to give you an idea, if then you look at, uh, this is a course of anticipation, and we look at the, what happened during the earthquakes, you pretty much see that where you have liquefaction is where you have the swamp. So pretty much is quite, uh, is quite linked. So we basically, obviously the, our ancestors were very clever they say why should i build a city just in front of the sea on the swamp obviously they say no let's stay a little bit back on a, in a good ground but then obviously because we expanded we went towards the sea obviously all these areas the one which then suffered mo the most in terms of damage uh, given by the by the earthquakes so the other thing is that uh, the uh, as I say, the city was pretty much confined in this area, and there were the four belts, which are, I mean, now named the Murals, Figueroa, Billy, and Rolleston Avenues. And uh, and uh, I have to say that in terms of uh, of uh, first uh, uh, construction of bridges, what happened before the establishment of the of the city council? I mean, the construction was a little bit random and pretty much. Uh, Everyone was trying to build uh, a bridge because it needed just to, to cross the, the road. So there was a sort of, uh, was not codified, nothing was codified. And obviously what you do, the first thing that you use, the material that you use is timber, because it's the easiest material to, 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 to use. And uh, what happened is that uh, once we had the establishment of the city council, what happened, the city council started saying, no, we have to do, build the permanent bridges, because uh, especially if you use the uh, New Zealand timber. The New Zealand timber is not very durable, so you have to. They had to import Australian uh, hardwood, which was much more durable. But uh, probably because of the weather condition, the life of those bridges were around uh, uh, 40, 60 years, no more than that. Now we design a bridge for 100-year life. So what's happened is that uh, the 
uh, most of the most of the of the bridges that were uh, designed for uh, being permanent were in the CBD, and uh, I will mention afterwards. You see uh, that uh, you know the Victorian bridges are made in the CBD, and that's because they've been quite robust, and so they've not been replaced uh, since they've been built in more than 100 years ago. Now, in that period, the until the 80s, the navigation was still uh, the best tool of transportation for heavy heavy uh, items and uh, but uh, then i think around that period the navigation has been stopped so and again obviously because you change the you know the uh, the uh, uh, mean of transportation then obviously you because uh, there were uh, problems with the with the ship's height they had to build up uh, swing bridges so this is ferry made the swing bridge so basically, when the ship is, is, is passing through, the, the bridge just rotates in this way to allow the, the ships to go through. And, uh, and that obviously, uh, nowadays, you, I mean, we don't have in Christchurch any more of those bridges. So that was a sort of an evolution related with the transportation. The other thing is that, as I said before, uh, in, uh, in this period, 1875 and the 90s, basically, we had quite uh, quite a big step up in terms of construction of bridges. And, uh, and what we had, we had, uh, first of all, there was really a will to uh, invest money to do nice and durable bridges. So as you can see, because even the river was not very wide, so the, the bridges that uh, you have, especially in the CBT, are mainly one span bridge. So you don't have uh, columns which are going through the river. And, uh, and what you have, the you had because there was the idea of having a permanent, a more permanent bridge. They didn't use timber, but they tend to use uh, concrete or uh, cast iron. So this is Colombo Street Bridge, and this is Worcester Street Bridge. I think the Harmac Street uh, uh, Bridge is exactly the same. They were built in pretty much in the same year. So we're talking about uh, uh, 1883, and those bridges are still there. As you can see, even in the in the details, you see the balustrades. They they are quite well manufactured. So again, this is a reflection of the that that period, the Victorian period. Uh, the we had even periods where, because the city was expanding, so uh, the 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 uh, the city council started to replace timber bridges outside of the CBD. So there were still many timber bridges dispersed outside of CBD, and they start making permanent bridges. But what you have to remember is that most of those bridges were cast in place. So uh, when you do a concrete bridge, you do, in that period, you could only do the bridges on site. So you could really, you, do, you didn't have chance as we have today to prefabricate elements. And uh, there was then the Second World War, and uh, and obviously, in this period, it was a little bit quiet. And the 60s, were the, this period was really, the, from my point of view, the renaissance of bridges. And uh, the reason is because, obviously, because after the war, you want to say, OK, it's time to you know, wake up and you know, just uh, improve what we have. But uh, the main thing was because the National Road Board was uh, giving, had a lot of money and was basically promoting uh, bridge replacement with, with an additional grant on, on top of the subsidy that was given to the, to the city council. So basically the city council was just uh, putting one quarter of the cost of the replacement, which is, was quite a good deal. And uh, at that period was also the period where we have the prefabrication, pre-stressed, prefabricated, uh, pre precast concrete uh, elements and mainly, if you look at this bridge, what was the idea was mainly to have the. This is called abutment. This is the column. The idea was to have these parts uh, cast in place, cast in inside, and and then the deck. You uh, do the deck with prefabricated elements. So the elements come from the factory. Well, the this uh, way of of. Uh, change the construction was really very cost effective. It was far cheaper to do everything on the, the deck uh, prefabricated than doing cast in place. And, uh, and obviously, you have also the advantage of having uh, better control because you are doing everything in the factory. And so if you look at the bridges, pretty much in that period, we have on the road bridge, Cashmere Road, Manchester Street, Fitzgerald Avenue. In those uh, periods, in the 60s, all these bridges are, have uh, cast in place 
um, we call this part uh, sub, uh, substructure. This is the superstructure. The superstructure is mainly the deck. This is called deck. So the deck is prefabricated, but the substructure, so abutments, foundation, and columns are cast in place. So that was really a big step because uh, what basically happened is that uh, if you had to replace a, a bridge, a timber bridge in the 80s, uh, after the 60s, the option was typically to go from timber to prefabricated, uh, prefabricated uh, uh, bridges. So this is a, a, a South, uh, South Brighton Bridge Street so bridge. So this is the columns are cast in place, cast in place, and this uh, these, uh, deck uh, is a prefabricated. These are prefabricated die beams which are manufactured in the in the factory. Then are are, are put in the, in the on site, and uh, there is a big difference as you can see. This is uh, far more slender, but obviously it's less durable. Now, if uh, we we look at the pretty much at the at what we have here, what we have got so far before the earthquake in terms of uh, building stock, we have quite a lot of bridges and. Uh, and uh, we have many pedestrian bridges because we have uh, two rivers. We have the Heaven River on the north and we have the Heathcote River on the south. And uh, pretty much we have uh, mm, a, a sort of density of bridges crossing the Heaven River, which is like two thirds of a, of a kilometer. So that is the pretty much the spacing that we have. Uh, Average spacing of uh, of bridges crossing the Avon, while Heathcote is, is, is even less. So, is uh, every 500 meters you have a bridge crossing the Heathcote River. So, it's quite a dense uh, uh, situation. And uh, what we, if we look at in terms of, uh, of these graphs, uh, basically telling you that if we look at the length, uh, this is the total length of the bridge. Uh, what we can say, we can say that uh, uh, our bridges are very short. So the Howard Bridge are very, very, uh, very sturdy. And so you can see that most of the bridges are with a maximum length of 30 meters. So we don't have very, very long bridges. So well, if we then look at terms of uh, construction, uh, uh, and we look at this graph, you can see that uh, we pretty much have a uh, few bridges. These are the pretty much the few bridges that we have in the CBD, the first ones that have been started with the city council, the Victorian ones, and then we pretty much replaced uh, all the bridges. And so if the replacement of the bridges happened, uh, of the timber bridge happened in uh, between, uh, let's say, the 90s up to the 50s, this is a ca cast in place. All the bridges cast in place, cast in sight. While uh, uh, beyond the 60s, fully prefabricated. Now there is a tendency to go back to cast in place. It's like fashion. So you do something and you go back to the past because we, I mean, we can create a cast in place by doing prefabrication as well. So there is, a, there is this uh, in the future things might change. But at this stage this is what we have. So every bridge which is beyond 60s is basically prefabricated means uh, the deck is prefabricated but the substructure, the columns, the foundation are cast in place. Uh, and uh, these, uh, these other graph is pretty much a little bit more detailed and uh, just uh, telling you that uh, we still have a, a good portion of timber bridges and, uh, but those timber bridges are mainly pedestrian bridges. So the, we, we lost pretty much all the timber bridges. Uh, now, without going too much uh, uh, into detail, uh, I will say that uh, the last important uh, timber bridge was the uh, Stanmore Road Bridge, which has been replaced uh, in 1995. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, we have uh, one which is uh, in Egli Park, the Elmore Lane Bridge, but that one is going to be replaced soon because it's been damaged by the earthquake. So we're pretty much losing all the timber road bridges. Uh, now, once you got a little bit these uh, few elements of history, now I think this will help you to understand better how was the performance of those bridges during the Canberra earthquakes. Now, the first, uh, the first start is, okay, what do you expect? So you expect of catastrophic failures. No, we have nothing like that. So the, this is an example of a catastrophic failure. And uh, you might have seen this is, uh, is uh, 
This is the ancient Hayway uh, bridge. It's a very long bridge, and uh, and uh, basically these, uh, the bridge always is very uh, flexible if uh, the earthquake goes perpendicular to the direction of the axis of the bridge. So this is, uh, as you can see, uh, the columns failed. This is the uh, detail of the, f of the columns. The columns failed, so the earthquake was really, the relativity of the earthquake was really in this direction. And so then j just a portion of the bridge overturned basically and, uh, and collapsed. So we didn't get something, we didn't have something like that. So that's, we were, we, mm, we were very lucky on that. And, uh, but what I have to say is that uh, when I start uh, mm, spending three months, four months of my life after the, after the earthquake to go through and look at bridges because the university was closed, uh, so uh, I realized that uh, really I could, even though we didn't get a lot of failures, there were few de details that were uh, hidden in the design that, uh, uh, caused uh, a few uh, a few damage to uh, damages to the bridges, and uh, it's really important the detailing that you do in a bridge, the bridge design. It's a quite neat and simple structure. So if you just screw up a detail, then you screw up the entire uh, the, the entire bridge will, will respond badly to that bad detail. And uh, when we look at the bridge, so usually we. Uh, especially in the NZTA design bridge manual, there is quite an emphasis on road bridges. So when we classify bridges, uh, we basically pretty much probably we do even in our society, uh, it's, uh, it, we classify a bridge of importance. It's very important if that bridge is very rich. So it means that if that bridge, the cost of that bridge is very high. So that bridge is going to consider very, very important. So the other parameter is that if the bridge is carrying a lot of vehicles, uh, a lot of vehicles per day, that bridge is very, very important. <coughs> so for example, a road, uh, the Moorhouse overpass bridge is a very important bridge. And that bridge, because it's not been uh, probably because of lack of money, was not uh, retrofitted before the earthquake. But that bridge was very, very vulnerable. So, and that was quite, uh, uh, by the analysis that they've done, it was quite clear that that bridge couldn't sustain any, any sort of earthquake. I mean, it, especially the crashes earthquake, because it, it did well with the Darfield earthquake. But then we have other things which are less clear to us. So, and uh, even for the design, is, is very tricky, because if you look at this pedestrian bridge, obviously we can say, okay, pedestrian bridge is not very important, because even though you might have the, you know, you might have a little bit of failure in the bridge, it's very unlikely you have a lot of people crossing the pedestrian bridge when you have the earthquake. But in this particular case, this bridge was a utility bridge. This is in Darlington, and underneath the the bridge there were two uh, 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 66 k volt power cables which were serving 20,000 people. So that bridge was retrofitted in 10 years before the earthquake. Without that uh, retrofit, the bridge uh, wouldn't sustain the load. But then we have other important factors that we have to consider when we look at a bridge. So this is Mandeville Pedestrian, which is one of the probably oldest bridges, 1854. It's still, a, 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 as you can see, is a timber bridge. It's a suspended timber bridge that's been damaged by the earthquake. But this bridge was really, really important, not for for any sort of use. It's very important because uh, many people lived with that bridge. And so those people, there was a sort of relationship with the bridge. And it was important not only for old people, but it was important also for kids because they were fishing from the deck. So again, you see, we can build up a relationship with the bridge. So that is really unique from my point of view. Now, in terms of earthquakes, you might have seen this many times. And uh, uh, you, we know that we are not in a nice position. So we are in, a, uh, we have uh, the Pacific plate, which is pushing against the Australian plate. But what was really unexpected is that uh, we got pretty much, we didn't <coughs> get the earthquake from the Alpine Fault, but we had uh, the earthquake happening from uh, an Eden Fault, which was very close to, to the Christchurch city. And uh, we got the September earthquake, which was pretty much, uh, the epicenter was in this area. And then we have the February earthquake, which was uh, 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 very close to the CBT. Obviously, when uh, when you look at even in the news, uh, uh, sometimes you know for other uh, international earthquakes, it pretty much you just refer to the magnitude, uh, the moment magnitude, and uh, obviously the 7.1 uh, 
even for my mother was calling from Italy, oh, this is 7.1, are you okay? Then, or 6.3, she didn't even call. So, you <laughs> see, so I, this is, a, then I explained my mom, uh, mom, it's not, it's not just the, the magnitude, it depends if it's close. So if that earthquake is, very, is under your feet, uh, you're going to be quite shaked quite a lot. And, uh, and that is really what happened with our city. This is an example that you might have seen. This is what the, the trace of the Alpine, the, the uh, Greendale Fault, which happened, uh, uh, which happened in September. And this was a line of, the, of, uh, of, of bushes that has been shifted uh, uh, for uh, uh, up to four meter horizontal and 1.5 vertically. And uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of comparison with uh, earthquakes, so what's happened is that uh, Certainly for our bridges, the February earthquake was really the most severe one because it uh, was very, very localized, but, uh, and uh, because we have uh, most of the bridges in the, in the, uh, look, uh, concentrated in the Chrysler city. So if you look at the, all this area, roughly all this area, which includes the Weimar Cariri uh, district and Selvin district in the Akaroa, well, I think we have like uh, 800 bridges, roughly. And uh, just in Chrysler, we have 300. But most of those bridges that we have in other areas, like even in Akarov, they're very, very small bridges. And most of maybe they are culverts, not, not nearly really big bridges. Now, you might have seen that uh, for uh, the September earthquake, the peak ground acceleration, so the ground shaking, was uh, uh, between 20% uh, and 35% of G. We have moderate liquefaction. While with the February earthquake, we had the peak ground acceleration very, very high, between 0.5 and in some cases, 2.2 G. So very, very high accelerations. And we had very extensive liquefaction. But what happened is that with the February earthquake, with the Duffy earthquake, for, for, I mean, especially for everyone, for, was quite, uh, the inspection was really, uh, really exhausting because we had pretty much not to, we didn't focus just on, on, uh, on the crisis bridges, but we had also to expect the Selvin and the Wamakari district uh, bridges. Uh, in terms of uh, comparison, I will just go quite quickly, but uh, in, by looking at the station and the records, uh, we can say that uh, by taking the, all the numbers of the, the, the stations recorded for September, and then the numbers recorded by, from February, and uh, we put in a table, and uh, we look at the average, so we can say that uh, the in average, the peak ground acceleration, the ground shaking of Christchurch was three times more than the ground shaking uh, recorded by uh, for uh, Darfield for the September one, so that is a go quite good indication. You see, the magnitude was far more, far less, but then uh, because uh, there was a very shallow earthquake very close to the city, we had a different effect. So this is pretty much a quite good indication, and obviously for for the Howard bridges, this was really very very catastrophic. I mean, in terms, especially for fun functionality. Now, what we we had, uh, you might have seen again, uh, experienced uh, uh, liquefaction. Liquefaction is, uh, is, uh, was uh, quite a devil uh, for, for, uh, for, um, uh, for our bridges as well. And you can imagine that uh, 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 most of the bridges that suffered extensive damage for liquefaction were the bridges on the eastern suburbs, where the, the, the bridges which were built on the swamp. And, uh, what is really critical also for uh, bridges, when you have a sort of situation like, uh, uh, like this, where you have uh, you know, the banks that you build around the bridge, typically, if you have a very poor soil, you tend to have uh, cracks, uh, lateral spreading cracks uh, happening, and so they, all the, the soil tends to flow down to a lower level. So that is typically what you have, especially if you're crossing a river, so the, the soil tends to drop down and flow into the river. The, this is pretty much the maps that uh, land damage from September, land damage from February. Obviously, it's a quite big difference in terms of liquefaction. And uh, this is a drive through where you can see that, uh, especially in the area close to the, close to the Avon River, all these areas, and the area where we, if you think, remember 100 years ago, that, that, that map was basically saying that this area was swamp. So this is pretty much. Red means uh, very bad liquefaction, and 
and uh, in where we had the sand was, uh, was okay at the end. We were worried about leak infection uh, 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 in New Brighton, but at the end was not, was not bad at all. So the pretty much quite uh, reflection with, the, uh, uh, with that map, which uh, without knowing a lot about the geotech, they say, oh, that's, that's a quite good, uh, good link. And you can see in this map, uh, these are the, the number, the bridges, the many bridges that they are, that are along the Avon River, and this uh, shaded area is basic, basically the high uh, liquefaction <laughs> uh, that we had uh, very close to the Avon River. This is the Avon River, this is the Heathcote River. In the Heathcote River, you see, we, there were, I mean, the, some zones there were a little bit of a liquefaction, but uh, was not so bad as, uh, as the, the Avon River. On the other side, these, uh, obviously those bridges were much closer to the epicenter, so they get a quite stronger uh, uh, ground, much stronger ground shaking, so it's a little bit um, balanced, if you wish. Uh, now, in terms of uh, understanding, I guess there, there might be some engineers here, so uh, sorry for that, but for, for people who are not engineers, I think it's, it's important just to understand that uh, you might have an earthquake and go perpendicular to the to the direction of the longitudinal axis of the bridge, or can go in this direction, and typically is much more critical when the the direction of the when the earthquake is going perpendicular to the bridge. And what's happening in the deck is really uh, is really transferring the load, the inertia forces generated by the by the earthquake to the to the columns. And really, the columns are the bridge columns are really doing uh, the dissipation. They're really dissipating the kinematic energy uh, introduced by the, by the earthquake. So pretty much, so if the earthquake is going this direction, so this column has to take, uh, has, to take uh, has to have enough energy to absorb uh, the energy generated by the earthquake. If it goes in this direction, it's typically the bridge is quite stiff because there is the soil. So that is pretty much a very, very basic, uh, basic uh, uh, understanding of the of the bridge, so the deck uh, doesn't dissipate any energy. The other effects correlated with the with the ground shaking is that uh, what's happening because because you have the ground shaking, the uh, the pressure of the water increases, and basically the the soil, the, it's called effective stress of the soil, goes down. So the soil becomes very very soft. And what's happening is that, as a consequence, you have that if you have, uh, like in this case, this is the, uh, this is the deck, this is the, the soil, this is the abutment, and this is the, these are the piles, which are basically trying to go down and pick up the, the good soil. What you have, it's happening is that the soil, as I said, tends to go down and flow against the river. It tends to go towards the river. And then, because that you have that movement, it's like uh, pushing, uh, uh, you have this uh, soil which is pushing against uh, against uh, the piles, is pushing against the abutment. So what's happening is that uh, you have an effect, uh, which is a sort of kinematic effect that is generated by the ground shaking, where basically the abutments tend to go towards the deck, and they tend to pound against uh, against uh, the deck. So it's a little bit they are correlated, obviously, but uh, they this is more a geotechnical problem. The other one is considered more a structural problem. Now. In terms of uh, damage, we had, uh, uh, we had as a comparison 13 bridges with significant damage in September and uh, 50 bridges with uh, a lot of damage in uh, Christchurch. And, uh, and uh, the other important aspect is that these are just the, the city council bridges. Then we have also the uh, NZTA, the, the state highway bridges. And it, for those bridges which are considered the important ones. We got uh, quite uh, quite a few. Uh, uh, you know, one out of five suffered uh, damage, moderate to significant damage. So, in even though no one's talking about bridges because uh, we didn't have uh, life safety problems, uh, the situation is not so so green. I would say. So we got uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, a situation where now. Um, Skirt is going to fix uh, pretty much 40% of uh, the bridge stock, even though maybe there are maybe they just need to do some painting. But before to this, it's not just the cost of the painting; is the, the 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 cost of paying the engineer who decide to say no, we do just the painting. 
So that's, uh, it's a quite uh, expensive process. So in terms of damage, what I would like, uh, that, um, uh, would like to do this, what I would like to point your attention on, uh, on the construction that we discussed with the history. So for example, this is a bridge, which is, uh, is uh, the bridge street. It was built in the 80s, so it's a prefabricated bridge. And what you can see, you can see that uh, because it's prefabricated, we basically have a sort of joint between uh, this is the deck, this is the abutment. And so what's happening is that when, uh, because in that area there was a lot of liquefaction, the abutment tends to uh, move, because it's pushed by the soil, move against, uh, against uh, the deck, uh, which is this part. And then the deck, the deck act as a sort, acts as a sort of strut. And so what happened then, the abutment is also pushed at the bottom. So because it's pushing, it's pushed by the deck, it's keeping the abutment at, uh, uh, fixed at the top, the abutment tends to rotate in this way. And because there, is not, uh, there are no bars which are connecting the deck with the, uh, with the abutment, and that is typically a, a situation that you have if you have a casting place bridge where it's basically everything is connected. What happens, you see in those bridges, you see a rotation of 10 degrees. So the abutment, you see, is not straight anymore. It's uh, rotated of more than 10 degrees. So it's uh, the, the best, I mean, it's, it's the best. I, mean, uh, I shouldn't say that. But it's, uh, if you want to see that, uh, in a, uh, and you, I think it's, uh, you can go for very close to the bridge. You go to the Hansa Drive Bridge. That one is amazing. So it's 10 degrees. So it's not amazing. But as I'm saying, it's good to, to visualize the, the effect. So uh, what you tend to have then, because there is this uh, soil which is uh, in generating some, uh, some, so it's basically deforming the pile, so you get damage even in the pile. So that is a quite uh, uh, very trick situation, because in a situation like this, uh, the deck is pretty much fine. The, you need to find out uh, what to do with that bridge. So you basically can replace the entire bridge, or in most of the cases, what's happening, they're ten, trying to replace uh, just uh, that part and, uh, and uh, uh, keep uh, preserve the, 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 the deck. So the difference, if you see this is a, a bridge, uh, Geyerst uh, Road Bridge. This is an integral bridge, so cast in place. In fact, it was in 19, built in 1954, just before the, uh, the uh, pre-stressing um, uh, technology in the 60s, and uh, you see the connection between uh, the deck and the abutment. In this case, it is uh, cast in place. So basically, there are uh, bars which are going through the, the abutment, so it's fully connected. So in this case, you can't really see back rotation. We call back rotation of the abutment because the abutment can't rotate because the deck is really uh, restraining at the top uh, the, the abutment. So in a sense, uh, it, in these sort of bridges, there is a little bit much more robustness, so they, from my point of view, are more resilient. On the bad, on the bad side, that uh, if then you have to uh, fix those bridges, then it might cost a little bit more than fixing the other ones. The the other uh, other amazing example: these uh, these are not really columns, are sort of walls which are sustaining the deck. And what happened is that uh, on one side of the of the gears, the, the liquefaction was really very very uh, severe, and uh, was basically the the soil was moving at the riverbed and pushed also the bottom of the of the of the column of this wall. And what happened because it was pushing in this direction, then the wall just cracked on this side of the wall, so it was not cracked on both sides. So that was quite interesting. So usually if you have a ground shaking, because the ground shaking is going one direction, the other direction, you expect to have cracks on both sides. But in this particular case, the crack was just on one side because the soil was just pushing from that river bank to here. So that was just like a force going in one direction. And this is damage that you uh, can see between the abutment and the bottom and the, and the piles. Now. Very similar, Avondale Bridge. This is, a, is another example of a bridge built in the 60s. Again, similar concept. Uh, the back rotation is a little bit better because what they did uh, in the, I think was, uh, was uh, 10 years ago, we started with the retrofit program. They tried to create a sort of uh, uh, called the semi-integral connection. So by putting some 
uh, steel plates, they try to, uh, to uh, prevent uh, uh, the rotation of the abutment within the deck. So, and uh, these are the steel plates uh, put, but I mean, they were not very effective because in fact, I think they are replacing the abutments of this bridge and with uh, new ones. The other important thing is that when you have this sort of uh, damage, uh, uh, certainly even though the bridge is fine, you have uh, a lot of damage in the road, the approaches, so it's quite obvious that uh, you have to change, you have to close the bridge uh, for three or four days. So we are looking at some solutions where we basically try to avoid even this sort of damage. Now, the pedestrian bridges, the, you, I mean, the, the pedestrian bridges are quite spectacular in terms of, uh, of uh, failure because they, uh, what happened, especially with the, with the uh, Darfield, the September earthquake, uh, they have been damaged because um, what happened is that uh, you imagine that uh, you have uh, a situation that is liquefaction that are spreading. And you have a bridge, uh, which is a pedestrian bridge, which is, which is typically very light, nice and slender bridge. And what's happening is that you know, at a certain point when you have the earthquake, because there is the effect of the, of the lateral spreading and liquefaction, the two river banks start moving and they move towards the river. They start pushing, squeezing the bridge. But the bridge is very tiny, it's very light. It doesn't have a capacity to, you know, to just sustain those forces. And so what happened? This is what happened. So you have a sort of buckling, uh, buckling uh, mode effect. And this is uh, this happened with uh, with um, was it the, the Darfield earthquake, and um, in uh, for uh, for uh, an arch type that is a situation which is much better because the arch works quite well in co in compression. But even in this case, this is the Snell bridge. There was damage, so there was a damage at the top, damage at the bottom, a damage at the bottom in this part. So this was the uh, the uh, uh, midway bridge in uh, in um, in the Avonside Drive. Uh, I think now the bridge has been removed uh, and now is in the uh, Heritage uh, Ferry Maid uh, Park. They cut in three pieces. I don't know what they're going to do, but they want to keep it. So, and uh, but what you can see, this is the damage that got up during the Darfield earthquake. It was already uh, was uh, basically ba it buckled, and you see here there is also buckling of some parts, and then lost the seating from these uh, from these uh, timber pylons. And then uh, this is the situation in February. So, and, uh, but the bridge was, uh, I mean, didn't fall, fall down, didn't fall down. So it was, a, was okay, in the same, it was not okay, but I mean, they could keep the bridge for, for a few months. So uh, the, this is the Kayapoi pedestrian bridge. This was again Darfield. As you can see, because uh, the deck uh, didn't have a lot of capacity, most of the, the Darfield, I would say the September earthquake really killed all the pedestrian bridges and uh, why the crashes really killed the, the road bridges. And uh, you see this case, what happened, they, because there were these compression forces and because the connection between the tower and the timber post was not well done, so basically they start rocking over this, this part, and so there was a sort of uh, one side went down, with the other side went, went, uh, went up, the other side went down, so it was really a messy situation. And in, uh, in Christ, in September earthquake, in Kayapoi, the Kayapoi area, uh, the, because the, the, the magnitude was uh, smaller for, for February, because Kayapoi was far away, so the effect was not uh, very, very, uh, was not very, very bad. In fact, I mean, the, uh, they straightened out, the, they were, I think the day before they, they straightened, uh, they, they straightened the bridge uh, for, for retrofit, and then they got the earthquake. So they were quite, quite lucky in a sense because, and um, the, this is another example of pedestrian bridge is the Snell Bridge, <coughs> as I said before, was damaged here. So it was a little bit of spalling of the concrete and then what then was damaged uh, at the, this should be the abutments of this part and this part. And even this bridge has been removed now. So the, it's not really, I mean, it's, we have done a project that's, that is actually, that is the replacement of that bridge. So the one on the table. And it's not clear if they're going to leave the bridge, over the, so they're going to do a new one or not. So it's a little bit uh, on the air. The other interesting thing that uh, we learned from this bridge, because in this case, the bridge is an arch, it's very strong. When you, when you have basically the, uh, 
the, the soil is pushing, but if you have something, in this case an ash, which is very strong in compression, what's happened is that uh, all these parts of the, of the river banks were moving towards the river, but only this part couldn't move of this part of the soil because basically the, the heart was restraining the movement. And so what happened, you see, because this part moved and this one was fixed, so there was huge cracks, uh, which were in this case perpendicular to the, to the river bank. So usually, as I say, when you have lateral spreading, if you notice, you have the cracks which are parallel to the river banks. But when you have a bridge which is very stiff, uh, the cracks are perpendicular. And what happened? The, because the cracks were very, very uh, deep, uh, and there was a sort of a shearing effect, uh, there were pipes. And the pipes had been sheared off. So that was quite, quite interesting for the research point of view. So uh, not for the people who are living there, of course. So. Uh, the, other, the other thing is that we had uh, also damage to the historical monumental bridges. And uh, the, the Bridge of Remembrance is fine, but uh, the Triumphal Arch, which is another bridge on the bridge, is, has been damaged. So I couldn't see that. Then it, it came out from a, a proper assessment done by Hopus um, International. And, uh, and obviously, this is a quite important, uh, is an important uh, element uh, of the city, but also for the bridge. And uh, what, uh, what happened is basically we, uh, it seems that uh, the bridge uh, is obviously, think about the earthquake, where in this direction, because there, are, there is an arch, and there is another arch here, it is quite stiff. But in the other direction, it is very, very soft. And so most of the damage occurred perpendicular, with the earthquake going perpendicular in this direction. And it seems that uh, uh, the most of the damage occurred at these parts of the, of, the, of the arch. So basically, the arch tried to go in this direction, move out, outside of the, of the screen, back and forth. And so you have a few cracks here. So obviously, there is a concrete, is a concrete uh, uh, bridge uh, done 100 years ago, 1924, and then it's covered with stones. So they have to remove all the stones and do the fixing. So it's quite a huge job. And we are actually a little bit, in, we are involved with, as a university, we're doing some analysis with, uh, with the practitioners. So what we did, we put together a database and uh, we try to understand what happened. So, and uh, what, when we do the database, we put, uh, we try to quantify the damage by components. So we tried, when we were looking at a bridge, we say, okay, let's classify the damage of the deck, uh, just this part and say from one to four. And then we were visualizing, by looking at the deck, we say, OK, this is four because it's been completely damaged, or this is one because it's fine. And then we basically, for each component, we came out with a sort of uh, damage index, which could tell us if that bridge was damaged or not. In this way, it's much, uh, it's much better, because you can try to find a rational way to classify the damage of each single bridge. So and that is pretty much the procedure. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the detail, but basically, as I said, we were just looking at uh, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, D0, D1, D2, D3, extensive damage, moderate, slight, none. And we did that for each single component. So the deck, uh, the connection between the deck and the uh, uh, substructure, the column, the foundation. So we did for each single com component in order to get a good, uh, a good evaluation of the damage. Uh, the, what it was really interesting when we then we collected all the, uh, all the data, that was also uh, in done in collaboration with uh, Hopus because they were doing all the uh, uh, inspections soon after the earthquake. Uh, we try also to see the difference in terms of performance between the uh, precast concrete bridges, post 60s, and pre 60s bridges. So just trying to understand how was the, uh, the difference in terms of performance. And uh, w what we found, we found quite, good, quite interesting things. I will say, so we, as I said before, we look at the abutments, so damage in a single abutment, and we classify the damage. Then we look at the superstructure, the deck. Many situations we have, you see the abutment pounding against the deck. And so we have to say, OK, this is damage 0, 1, 2, or 3. And then we did for the columns. and. Uh, and then we did also for the approach, so the parts which are very close to the bridge, try to classify what was the damage for a single component. 
And what uh, this is pretty much the, the results is that uh, what we found is that uh, the Crisis earthquake was certainly much more severe, so we did the comparison just for the crisis earthquakes, and uh, we found that uh, the uh, we had 15% uh, of the damage, 20% of, of bridges which were damaged, while uh, with cry with this for September with crisis we had more than 60% of bridges which were damaged, and we in these we had uh, you know we go from minor to ex uh, severe damage, and then we we. Also, in those graphs, we uh, try to differentiate the look at the situation between uh, casting uh, place, precast, then we look at mesury, steel, timber, and, uh, and mixed. So we try also to understand if, uh, if there, there was a difference between a timber bridge and, uh, and a steel bridge in terms of performance. The main difference was really in terms of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, of uh, casting place and precast uh, bridges, so the the precast bridges were the one which suffered more in terms of damage. The other thing that uh, I was mentioning is that when we look at these uh, at, uh, at this graph, uh, really for us the severe damage could be situation like Murau's over bridge, which has been uh, if you notice been uh, got some columns that have been uh, cracked. Or the Anzac Drive bridge. This bridge is, I think, it's going to be replaced soon. And this is bridge. So this bra this bridge is uh, old, is uh, 1961. But this bridge is very young. This is uh, has been designed in, in uh, 2000. So this is quite uh, surprising that uh, didn't perform well. And uh, and then uh, these this one is a sort of average. Is in 1980. And you see those two have been mainly damaged by liquefaction ladder spreading because you see that the abutment is back rotated. As you can see here, this was mainly generated by ground shaking. So really it looks interesting because we are researching, we are evolving, and then uh, when you have a situation like that, I mean, uh, this is my opinion then. If you talk to another engineer, we'll say, no, that's, that's crap. I think that's, uh, I think that the, uh, uh, the uh, precast bridges perform well or better, but it's uh, from my point of view. I mean, if you then look at the bridges, it seems that uh, they certainly, by just uh, visualizing the bridges, the integral bridges perform far better because they in, because probably they were old bridges because they've been very robust because uh, the they were over designed so. They were not designed for earthquakes, but they were over designed for, for vertical loading. So they had much more material than needed. So that was really a, a, a certainly an explanation for that. And as I say, the tendency is try to use uh, prefabrication as much as we can. And the tendency is try to create a sort of uh, connections which make uh, this bridge, can make uh, this bridge which is prefabricated, can become integral. So basically you can, this is prefabricated, this is cast in place, but then you can just cast in just this part and make sure that you have bars going through in order to create a sort of connection which make the bridge integral, even though it's using prefabricated elements. So that is pretty much the idea behind that. The other thing that I learned, and that was pretty much amazing, and I put a research proposal, uh, a big pro uh, research proposal which uh, didn't pass, but that's okay. But it was, uh, was really good because uh, uh, this was really novel and no one is researching that, so you know this now. Uh, uh, the interaction between uh, uh, other services with bridges. So what's happening is that when you design a bridge, the bridge engineer doesn't talk to the, uh, to the, the engineer who designed the, the pipes. So what happened when you've done your bridge, you go away, and so you don't think about how uh, how to design the connection between the pipes and the bridge. So when you have the bridge which is moving, and you say, oh, my bridge is fantastic, will not fail. But then if you have a pipe which is running through and you don't design a connection for that, what happens is that you can have the failure of the pipe. And obviously, no one is going to be killed. But then if this is a sewage pipe, then you are polluting the river. Obviously, it's, it's not nice. So you can understand that this is a quite important aspect. And with, with crash crashes, it was very critical because we have most of the pipes are really running through the bridge. So that was really a key aspect. I hope that uh, next round, the government will be 
will be good that will give me the money for researching this topic. So, but what we found is that uh, the, there was quite consistency with what, uh, what uh, we, we found in the, between the, what the skirt has found with our database. So out of uh, 300 bridges, they say 82% of the bridges are still open, and structurally signed, 6.6% 6 .6 is severely damaged. But as I said before, um, at the end, uh, the pretty much 140 bridges are going to be uh, fixed uh, uh, under, under skirt. So, and in our database, we have 4%. So at the end, it's not, uh, we found that uh, what we, we, we have seen, what we put in other database is quite consistent what uh, SCIRT is planning to do. The, there, we, there have been some uh, securing works, but uh, I think I will skip this, it's not very important. So soon after the earthquake, uh, the engineers have been very, very great, and they try to secure the, uh, some bridges, which especially the, this the Murau's bridge. So again, if you think about that, uh, you have a bridge which is going to be damaged, and maybe you design the bridge to accept the damage, because that damage is part of uh, the role of the bridge to dissipate the energy. Uh, then what's happening is that uh, you basically, uh, uh, you basically uh, need to think about what is going to be the uh, remedial work you have to do after the earthquake. This is quite, quite important. So how can we improve uh, this seismic resilience? So that is really the, the, the key part. So uh, the, the skirt doesn't have, uh, as I say, five years life and uh, they have to do uh, fix all these bridges quite soon, and these are all the bridges along the Avon River, and they're basically planning to finish most of the design by the end of 2013, beginning uh, of 2014, and then the construction will start soon afterwards. So even for us, as the research is not easy to, you know, we, do, we have quite a limited time to convince the practitioners to go with an innovative solution. So. The, the key thing is that uh, when, uh, when, you design, uh, when you design a structure, typically what you do, you have a sort of matrix that you say, if the earthquake, if the, the, uh, let's say the, the intensity uh, is on this side, and this is the damage that you measure, damage downtown and dents, the three Ds, so if you increase the intensity, you expect that the damage is going to increase. So this is pretty much the line that you have increase the damage, increase the intensity, maximum mercury that you can expect, and you will expect that the structure is going to be close to the collapse. But what happens is that if we try to think about, uh, and we can, if we use uh, new, new solutions, we innovative seismic technology, we can try to design structures which are very far away from collapse, even when you have a very strong earthquake. That is pretty much the message. So if you have a structure, I think this is the column of your bridge, so this is the column, and you have an earthquake going uh, in this direction, so basically perpendicular to the axis of the bridge, so go in this direction. What's happening is that you have the earthquake, and after the earthquake, this part is really the part which is dissipating the energy. And uh, because it's dissipating the energy, it's still inside, which is going to going becomes a sort of uh, is going to go into plasticity and is going to dissipate the energy and you have all these sort of situation and the column is not straight but what we have uh, implemented there is a solution where you can have the earthquake and uh, we call this motion so the column when you push and pull so you have the earthquake the column is rocking like the rocking chair so it's rocking over the uh, uh, foundation uh, foundation pad and so, and because we put a rubber band inside, the column is going back to the original position. This is really quite a unique feature. And uh, I say that uh, this is the Toyota Corolla, and this is the Ferrari. So uh, maybe some of you have the Toyota. It's a nice car, but if uh, I tell you that uh, you can buy a Ferrari at the same cost as the Toyota for a Corolla, what do you, would you buy, honestly? <laughs> I will buy the Ferrari because it's Italian, of course. <laughs> so, but this is really the example that just to give an idea. Now, the, the problem what we have with those bridges is that uh, the key thing is that uh, if you think about these uh, 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 
bridge which was built in the 80s, if you have uh, that plastic, we call that uh, this one plastic hinge, the area where you have uh, all the damage, this is the traditional system. Imagine that you have cracks and you have to understand if the bridge has capacity, residual capacity after the earthquake. So you have to think about if I have an aftershock, because I got the damage in the column, uh, what is the capacity that the bridge has if I have another earthquake, another aftershock? So imagine that this is the situation on, uh, on that bridge and the, that plastic hinge is in a deep water. That is a mess. So if we have uh, the Ferrari solution, which basically have uh, these uh, 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 rubber bands inside and fuses, these are sort of uh, fuses which are placed externally, what you can do after the earthquake, you go there, replace these uh, fuses, and then the bridges with new ones, and the bridge is ready to go. So this is really the key thing. So. And the post-earthquake capacity is really, really an important feature. And uh, I think the uh, skirt and uh, the, the, I mean, our city spent a lot of money paying engineers to understand what was that capacity after the earthquake, which is fine. It's good for the engineering firms. But we should try to, you know, go beyond that and find to have a solution which has a backup, backup plan. Know what is going to be. We don't, if we go with this solution, we don't care about the post circular residual capacity. We just substitute those fuses and we put new ones. So I want just to show you this video because we'll help, uh, we'll help you to understand better. I have to click on. So this is a wall. It's a timber wall or, or working with uh, also on, uh, on timber buildings with uh, other colleagues at the University of Cambridge, Professor Buchanan and Dr. St uh, Professor Stefano Pampanin. So what happened? So this is, uh, is the force that uh, the wall can take, and this is the displacement. If you look here, so these two are the rubber bands, which is this. It's a steel which is very, very flexible. It's like a rubber band. You can't really stretch it by hand, but it's really, really flexible. And then the fuses are those just piece of bar and uh, these are the connectors. One part is connected at the bottom. The other part is connected at the top. If you want, I can pass it around. It's a little bit dirty. So are you, do you want to touch? So it's a, it's a civil engineering feeling. I have dirty hands, so that will be. So you see what's happening here. That is the sort of behavior that you have. And what happened is that basically the wall was rocking one side and the other side. And those uh, rubber bands were just uh, restoring the wall to the original position. So that is really the key feature of this system. And uh, we designed those uh, fuses in a such a way that uh, they uh, dissipate all the en energy. We don't damage the connection between the wall and the foundation. So after the earthquake, we just replace those uh, devices and we put, uh, and we put uh, new ones. So, just to give you an idea how it works that fuse, we've done some tests uh, just on the single fuse. So we are just uh, simulating what is going to be the stretching, the capability of this fuse. And uh, this is the force that the, the, the that piece of steel can take. And this is the displacement. You see the displacement, it can go up to 30, 38 millimeters, which is a, it's a small uh, element, and uh, it's quite a lot. And uh, the area, so we'll, when we measure the energy, the area is basically the area of this part. So if you look at these curves, and so you just measure this area, this is a quite big area. It means that that element is quite capable to absorb uh, a lot of energy from the earthquake. So. The beauty of this technology is that uh, the, these rubber bands, that, uh, this piece of steel, which is very flexible, is already used for bridges, for, especially in the United States, for uh, bridges which have uh, prefabricated uh, columns made of segments. So the, you see this column, you see those, these are concrete blocks, and then they clamp all these concrete blocks with these rubber bands, with these pieces of steel. 
And so they're using that for construction purposes. So, but what they did, they used that, uh, those sort of technology just in bridge, in bridge, uh, for bridges constructed in non-seismic areas. So what we want to do, we want to use these rubber bands in seismic areas. And what uh, you can see here, this is another example. You have the, the concrete block, these are the bars. Then there will be couplers, elements which join pieces of bars. And then from the top, uh, you tend to, with these rubber bands, in order to be more effective, you pre-stress. So you pre-tension these, these, these bars that you connect at the top of the column. This is the, the final product. So if you had at the bottom of the column some fuses, the, the other elements that, that I was uh, uh, passing around, then we have a sort of solution which, is, uh, which has uh, the capability of restoring, the rubber bands are restoring, and the fuses are dissipating the energy. So this uh, bridge uh, is an example of a similar concept uh, which has been implemented in the 80s by Ivan Skinner, a very famous uh, uh, Kiwi engineer. And, uh, and uh, this uh, bridge is, uh, is a railway bridge, it's a very tall bridge. And the difference is that uh, this bridge doesn't have uh, these rubber bands that I was mentioning before, it just has all the diffusers. But what's happened during the earthquake, the, there are those two legs. So the bridge is going to do some, the, the column, basically. If the earthquake is going this direction, this is what it's going to do. This is the rocking that it's going to do. So there will be a situation where the column is just uh, one leg is basically taking all the load. But there's going to be a huge uplifting. So what we are trying to do, and uh, this is the project that I uh, have here at the University of Canberra. We have a four-year project. We started in 2011, just after the earthquake. And we are trying really to develop prefabrication for columns uh, together with uh, 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 so solutions which are, uh, um, which are minimizing the post-earthquake uh, uh, damage. So we basically want to have solutions which uh, aims to have uh, uh, have uh, bridges which don't have to worry about post earthquake repar reparability. These are pretty much people. Uh, I want just, this is the stuff. I want to just mention the, there are a few students here. So, I mean, this is really their presentation. So, I'm just showing what they have done. So, thank you to the students, first of all. So, but really, this is a what we try to implement uh, is a solution which, uh, where we try to prefabricate the columns, but we still uh, have damage, which is pretty much similar to what's happening right now with the cast-in-place solution for the columns. The difference is that if you have a prefabricated column, you have the advantage of a better control, uh, control quality of the material, your speed of construction is going to be better. And so this is the first solution, but we accept the damage. So this is called uh, uh, prefabricate a column with damage. So this is again is uh, if you want the Toyota Corolla and the uh, this is, I don't know this is probably is uh, another is another is a Honda it's a better version, and uh, so this is the casting place. This is the uh, uh, the prefabricated column but with high damage, and then we have another solution which we call control damage. We basically accept to have the damage at the bottom, but we control in a better way that when after the earthquake, we go there, we replace the fuses, but we have to do some work with the concrete. And this is, uh, for me, is the Audi. So that is that solution. And then the solution I was explaining before with the wall, with the rocking wall, that is the Ferrari. So basically, that is a solution which is a little bit more expensive uh, than the other solutions, but obviously has a better performance. So you pay a little bit more in upfront cost, but it has a better performance. So it's I mean, you don't pay like, the, the, it's not like the difference Ferrari or Audi, but it's, uh, I mean, you pay, it's like five, ten percent more than conventional design. And this is an example of a test that we did at the University of Canterbury. So this is the, if you want, this is the, uh, the uh, Corolla and the Honda. So this, the, and this one is the, is the improved version. It's a little bit, it's not really the Audi, but it's uh, very close. And what we have done here, what you see, th those, uh, those columns are really, really tested, like really uh, simulated by pushing and pulling the columns at the top. Uh, and they've been got, they got the same intensity, if you, will, if you wish. But the difference is that uh, with this one, conventional design, when you go to a very, very high demand, this is what you have. 
And uh, if you do a little bit of improvements, and this, as I said, is not really the Ferrari, at the same demand, this is the damage that you have. It's far less. And the, the other beauty of doing everything prefabricated, even the columns, is that uh, it's very, very quick uh, to construct. So this is an example of, uh, of a solution that uh, we are actually, we tested uh, two days ago. This is Mustafa, the PhD student, this is the technician. So we are testing the, uh, these, uh, instead of having one column, we have two columns and the, and the beam at the top. And then on top of the beam, there will be the deck. And what we have done, we in proposed a solution which are fully prefabricated. So this is the foundation, there is a socket, you put the column, and then you put uh, some grout between the column and the, and the foundation, and that create, uh, create a sort of integral con connection. And then at the top, there are those starter bars. And what you do, you, you, you come with the beam, you put the beam, and then uh, you seal the bottom part. So this is the, bottom, the top part of the column, this is the beam. You seal that part, and then from the top, you pour the grout. And that what happened, that creates this, uh, is a monolithic solution. It's a sort of integral solution, but has been done with, uh, with uh, prefabricated elements. And so we tested this solution. And it worked quite well. But again, with this solution, we accept to have damage. So what we, we this is for us, is a, is a better improvement of the casting place solution. But what we want to do, we want to do more. We want to have something which is a, a controlled damage solution. So the idea is to now have a solution where we have a column, where we have the bars which are placed internally, but uh, we fuse down the bar, so we create those fuses at the bottom part, and uh, we know that uh, basically the, when we have the, the earthquake occurring, you basically we know we are damaging just this part of the, of the entire column. And so what we will have to do, we will have to replace uh, the, this part of the column, but everything is controlled. So while when you're designing the conventional design, you have many cracks and you don't know exactly what happened in, in each single bar. And uh, this is an example of, uh, of, the, of the solution that, we, that uh, we tested at the University of Canberra. And, uh, and this is another solution where we, instead of having a square column, we have a circular column. So what is really important with this, uh, uh, just to focus your attention, do we, that uh, piece of steel that uh, I was circulating with has those two the top and bottom parts are called couplers. They're used to... Uh, connect the other parts of the, the bottom part of the, of the foundation here to the top part of the column. What we have done, these, those, so those, uh, those fuses are basically inserted in the bottom of the column. You see this uh, brownish uh, uh, tape, this is uh, called denso tape, it's a greasy tape, and we put around, uh, around the bar, and then we put the stirrups, and then we create a formwork, and then we pour the concrete. We, we shake the column, and then after the, the, the shaking, we remove the concrete, we cut off the stirrups, we remove the tape, we unscrew the bars, we put the new ones, and then we put the stirrups, put the concrete, and the, the column is ready to go. So we accept the damage, but it's controlled. We know exactly what to do after the earthquake. So that is really the advantage. And obviously, if you want to spend more, you go for a Ferrari, where you basically have, uh, instead of having the bars placed in internally, you put, you put the bars placed externally. And because you put those bars externally here, you need to build up a collar. And uh, you need to also detail a little bit better these dissipative fuses. So it's going to cost a little bit more. But the advantage is that uh, after the earthquake, it will be far easier and far cheaper to replace those devices. So that is the advantage. So now, what can we do with those things? So we have these solutions. What can we do with, uh, with our city? And this is pretty much the, the final part. So we have, uh, you know, this is the Heaven River. And these are the critical areas of so Victoria Square. It's North Frame. And obviously, these are. Uh, is an area where we should try to have a lot of innovation. And innovation can be seismic innovation, 
or innovation can be something like that, a very nice pedestrian bridge. Now, the seismic technology can be anything that we are researching. Obviously, I didn't want to go too much uh, broader because they, we can even use uh, quake breakers or seismic isolation devices. But that is another, another aspect uh, that uh, will take another, another lecture, maybe next year. But uh, what is it very important is uh, the technology. And in New Zealand, we have to uh, use our knowledge. We are world leader in this technology. We should show that we are world leader to everyone. So that should go somewhere in, uh, in, the, in the CBD. But what we should also put is innovation materials. So we, if we could use maybe ultra high performance concrete. It's a, a, it's a concrete which has the, the same strength of a, of a piece of steel. And uh, or we should use uh, a new technology which uh, use uh, rubber bands with timber. It is pretty much the technology we develop with timber buildings. And if we do those things, we can create beautiful bridges which are very, very slender. So these are, again, comes back to the first slide, freedom, freedom and lightness. So imagine to have, uh, a, this is a called the cable state bridge in, uh, in uh, your CBD, and you are walking over uh, that bridge. It looks like flying over the river, right? And because, because the material, the bridge is very, very thin. So if you do these with uh, ultra high performance concrete, that is the uh, Snell bridge. It's 30 meters long, this bridge. And uh, the, the thickness was something like this. So made just of concrete. And what we wanted to do on top of that, this was a, a, my final year student. I can just twist a little bit like that. Uh, you see this glass? This is structural glass. So the idea is that when you walk over this bridge, you can see down, you can see the river. So again, this is something that can be done. It's just a matter of, uh, of, uh, of uh, getting into the knowledge of those things. Maybe there, there are not standards available, but uh, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of literature on these, uh, on these materials and this technology. And then the aesthetic appearance. This is something that everyone can judge. Oh, that is a nice bridge. It's a, uh, it's a ugly bridge. This is, is an OK bridge. But again, even in these, uh, I mean, we teach how to uh, design a proportion, a very nice proportion bridge. Because that is not just making a bridge with many colors. It's just also a matter to fit the bridge in the environment. And, uh, I mean, the, these are four examples. I want just to point your attention on this one, because this is the Peace Bridge in Calgary. Because this bridge is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, has been designed by the uh, top bridge engineer in the world at this stage, is a Spanish guy, Calatrava, Santiago Calatrava. And uh, if you look at these bridges, the, their, his bridges are really fitting very well with the environment, are very light, are very elegant. So, Again, this is one, uh, it's quite strange. This is a red bridge. Usually it goes with white bridges. And uh, so the, he developed a, quite a good skills. He's an architect and engineer. And he, he had this ability to fit elegance and uh, lightness in, uh, in every sort of environment. And I think we should really give a blank check for innovation. So really, so uh, actually, I will be the one managing innovation. So if you can give a <laughs> blank check to me, I will be very happy. So but because, for example, and this is a quiet thing. So imagine that we have a bridge of remembrance. And we uh, now thinking we can't really have a structure which is going to accept damage. Think about the conventional system. You need to have uh, the you need to absorb the energy. You need to accept to have damage in the structure. Then we'll imply to like, if we have a stronger earthquake we had uh, two years ago, we might have a uh, more severe damage. We need to start thinking why not using this the technology we I was showing before for this bridge, maybe just allowing this bridge to rock at the bottom here, and then put some. Uh, steel devices, these are particular ones which are activated by the sliding. So you can do a cut through. This is the arch. When you, uh, the earthquake go in this direction, you basically have the, 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 the two parts of the bridge which are doing something like this. And the steel plate is acting as a fuse. After the earthquake, what you do, you go there. You remove that just that portion of, uh, of stone. 
you change the device, and then the, the arch is ready to go. I mean, so, so this, for me, is very important. But the, what we should try to do, we should do something that uh, you guys are very good. I mean, uh, it's do something like the Te Papa Museum. I'm just really, when I, when I went there the first time, I was like a kid. I said, this is great. Because the, the fact that this is a base isolated building, right? So you're staying on these quake breakers. But the beauty of that is that uh, you can go down in this room, the, the quake breaker room, and there is the history. And there is the, the, the how, how it works. We should do something like that for this one. This is a new technology. This is our technology, it's University of Canberra technology. So we could do just a cashel mall instead of you know uh, giving uh, that uh, that maybe ten square meters to the, to a shop. We say no, no. This is the the technology shop, you know, the technology room, and th this is going to be unique because again, it's going to attract a lot of people, and uh, because there will be curiosity. We uh, I, as human beings, we are curious to know new things. So the same thing we do, even though you know no, you know nothing about. Uh, uh, about engineering, you have been, I guess, to see the quake breaker room because it's quite unique. The other thing is the aesthetic uh, appearance, and this is probably the most important thing because it's really the one that we really can appreciate without uh, knowing nothing. And uh, there are good examples in, uh, in New Zealand, and uh, this, from my point of view, is probably the most beautiful bridge that we have in New Zealand in terms of uh, uh, aesthetic innovation. And uh, the bridge is, is designed by a friend who is working in Wellington. And he spent one year with Santiago Calatrava in Zurich. So he's Spanish, but he, he works in, uh, in Switzerland. So it's quite amazing. These, uh, I, honestly, when I came over here, I didn't know about New Plymouth. And then I saw this bridge, and now I, I still have to go there. But I will go there for the bridge. And then when I was uh, visiting the, the, the website, I mean, sorry if someone is from New Plymouth, sorry. <laughs> but uh, when I was at the website for the, for the city, I mean, the first thing that you see is the bridge. So again, you think about that, uh, you know, if you have to go through and say, oh, by the way, that is a nice bridge. Well, we should stop by, maybe we stay overnight. So that is money which is flowing, getting back to the city. And uh, if you think that uh, we have, or in days, uh, uh, we are basically building a new city. If you think we could have four or five uh, bridges like this one, that would be amazing. We will have uh, a lot of people coming over, obviously spending more time in our city, and then everyone is happy because you, there will be many, many shops that are selling uh, you know, all the gadgets, and uh, everyone is, is, uh, is happy. The, and you, you know these. I mean, there are, we can have these uh, symbols. We can have uh, a Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, in Christchurch, uh, so and uh, we can have a Sydney Harbour Bridge, but you know quite well if you have been in Sydney or in San Francisco that uh, the I mean the, the tourism because of those bridges is uh, is amazing. You go to the Golden Gate, there is a big store. It's like uh, the New World in Fendleton, which is basically just selling gadget on on uh, on the Golden Gate Bridge. So this is really something that. Uh, I know that we have time. We don't have time because the time is limited. We want to have everything done, but I'm happy to wait. I, honestly, I'm happy to wait if the, the, the bridge designer here in Christchurch say, "Oh, we take ten years, but we do a better job." I don't. I, honestly, it doesn't change my life if uh, having the, these nice pedestrian bridges in ten years instead of five years. And uh, I want just to point out this that. Uh, I think that we have, uh, as uh, New Zealand engineers, we have uh, quite a lot of creativity. So, and uh, I'm actually trying to, uh, I try really to push the, my students to go to go really beyond just doing being engineers, trying to become architect because this is really the key thing. So maybe it will not be for crash and rebuild, but really we, I think that uh, from the education we can really. Uh, build up that uh, that willing for for each single uh, engineer to go beyond the standards. So try to go maybe to do a si very nice bridge like the Terewa Rewa bridge. Uh, obviously, that is not uh, you don't have a book which says how to, how to design the bridge. You need to be a little bit brave. You need to put creativity, and then you have to go beyond the schemes. 
And I think with these, uh, we have the skills because we are teaching here at the University of Canberra this. And Chrysler Rebuild is a big opportunity, but obviously uh, the time is really the, the thing that we don't have. And that is a pity from my point of view. So I will ask uh, the, 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 the key people to wait a little bit more and try to really work uh, and try to have uh, as much as we can in terms of innovation. I want just to show you that video, if it works. And then, it should work. And this should tells you that uh, This is what we teach, probably you have seen uh, this. We have a bridge competition over here. So if you don't know this, uh, next year is going to be pretty much in October. And those, uh, those students are designing the bridge to sustain uh, two people if they with the third one. And sometimes it doesn't work, as you can see. But you see, these, uh, these are very, very nice and innovative bridges. And they're using uh, timber. MDF, actually. And if you look at these, I mean, these are very strong. But think about that this is just a, see, this is a suspension bridge. This is just the second year of civil engineering. So first year of civil engineering, second year of engineering. Now, the, 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 there is one. This is the most amazing bridge I've ever seen. This is a Red Bull bridge. <laughs> Have you seen the logo? So they basically create a Red Bull bridge. Okay. This is the Italian bridge. This is a very nice. <laughs> Obviously, there is a little bit of influence when I teach my students. This is another black and white. This is the, you know, this is not. Another Italian bridge. So. So what, I, what I'm saying is that basically we don't, let me just because I have, sorry. So what I'm saying is that uh, we have the capabilities to design uh, nice bridges. So it's just a matter of uh, going beyond the schemes. And, uh, and uh, I think, as I say, the time is short. And, uh, and there is no time to wait for innovation. So that is really the, the thing that I'm regretting a little bit, that uh, we tend to, you know, we want to have everything done. And it would be nice in this case to wait a little bit more for those bridges and spend a little bit more, more time for the, for the innovation. <coughs> because when you put, you invest in innovation, obviously you have a high risk, very high risk. And, uh, and if you are a politician or asset manager, you say, why should I take this risk for a bridge that maybe, you know, is we're going to have an earthquake, and if it doesn't work, I'm going to have all the responsibility. It's easier to go with business as usual. So obviously, it's, I can understand this position. And, uh, but being an engineer, then you can say, okay, maybe, thi maybe thi things will not happen for at least uh, 50 or 100 years. So you can say, okay, Let's do business as usual. I mean, will not be by business. In 100 years' life, there will be another generation which will have to fix the bridges, right? That can be a selfish way of thinking. And then I say, is this progress? So I think we really should try to push ourselves and go beyond the schemes and really think that we should try to have a really 
a, a Christchurch, uh, a Christchurch, which is a Christchurch uh, of innovation for bridges, and it can be the same for buildings. But for bridges, especially because it's, those bridges should be our icons, the icons of the city. I want just to mention that if you are interested in bridges, maybe now you ate bridges after this presentation. <laughs> so, uh, but you can. I mean, we are building up this website, and then one of my students is really. Uh, helping on this, so it's uh, the website is Bridge Community, and you can log in. We have every two months we have a Canberra Bridge Group, so we invite uh, practitioners and we have seminars. So they are very technical, but you are uh, welcome to come. I mean, it's if you like, if you want to know what's going, what's going on. And this is pretty much are the students. I want to acknowledge the students who helped me quite a lot during these years. I want to acknowledge Maria who helped me with the presentation the last two nights. And um, so thank you, thank you for your patience because I went beyond as usual, the hour, as, uh, as, uh, as you can see, being in Italy, I'm not able to keep the time. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your patience.